Hey TM, my name is Noor Aladeeb and I'm the president of your Students' Union. Hey, my name is Maurice Hopkins and I'm Vice President External. So welcome to I don't know what number vlog this is, but pretty much in this vlog we are going to be talking about the new U of T proposed policy called the New Policy on Open, Accessible and Democratic Student Organizations. Um, so pretty much what we, what we really want to do in this vlog, um, because we've been consulting with a number of different uh, students on campus, whether they're in clubs and academic societies or not, um, there have been a number of different questions that we actually want to address, and we feel like it would probably be better to do so in a vlog. That way we can kind of like talk to you. You're not talking back at us, but we're still talking. Um, as opposed to writing it in a, like a message or a letter, just because it, I, I find it easier this way. Um, so what we're going to do really is we're going to talk about the history of this policy. We're going to talk about what the policy really is and what it entails and what it means for us. And then we're going to talk about some of the issues that we have with the policy. Um, so what I'm going to talk about first is really the history of how this policy came about. So the new open, accessible and democratic organized student organizations policy came about in 2014 um, during a student society summit. So that summit was hosted by the University of Toronto administration to address some concerns that um, some different like different organizations were having. So there were some issues that Engineering Society and Trinity College were having with the University of Toronto Students Union, which is the Students Union at St. George. Um, so they called this policy, sorry, they called this summit to have a meeting to discuss some of these issues. Um, so UTMSU was invited to participate in this summit, um, but there were a number of major stakeholders that were actually not present. And that was the Scarborough Campus Students Union, so SCSU for short, the Association of Part-Time Undergraduate Students, which is APIS, um, and the Graduate Students Union at the University of Toronto, which is GSU. Um, so those were three stakeholders that were not present at that, at that summit. Um, after the summit kind of took place and there were um, it, it kind of carried on. There were some concerns that the UTMSU felt were necessary to raise. Um, and at that point in time, when UTMSU raised those concerns, uh, they withdrew from the summit alongside UTSU at the time, uh, the University of Toronto Students Union, not at the time, they still exist, and the Arts and Science Students Union, which for short is ASU. Um, and what the UTMSU did at the time was they actually compiled all of the issues that we had with the summit in a really long document. So one, two, three, four, four double-sided pages. That's eight pages. Um, and there were a number of concerns, so I'm actually going to read some of them to you. So one of the concerns was that um, UTM students are treated like second-class students. And this isn't the first time we've seen it, because we've seen it in a number of different academic policies. So for example, when the University of Toronto had their strike, we saw that UTM students had different academic policies compared to St. George students. Um, and I'm going to read one portion out to you folks right here. Uh, we cannot help but notice that there have been discussions at the summit about why some societies represent cultural groups, why we shouldn't represent cultural groups like the Chinese undergraduate students, and groups like the Sexual Education Center and the Center for Women and Trans People are controversial, and that these questions have been brought up by non-racialized students or the administration. So at the time of the summit, there were some concerns, some xenophobic and racist remarks that were made that were not addressed. And uh, the UTMSU, along with UTSU and ASU, felt like it was, un it was really uncomfortable and not the space to be making com like comments like that. Um, another thing was that we felt like it was a breach of student union autonomy. The summit had engaged in conversations contemplating scenarios where UTMSU, SCSU, and APIS do not even exist. Um, so they were having conversations about kind of like removing this, these organizations. Um, but what was weird was that Scarborough Students Union and APIS were not even present for those discussions. So I kind of think it's problematic to be having conversations about solutions when those stakeholders aren't even present to engage in those solutions. Um, and with that being said, we felt like there was a lack of um, scope and terms of reference or even purpose for this summit itself. So if the purpose of this summit was to resolve issues between UTSU and um, different colleges or societies, then why did we have an entire summit with all of these organizations? Um, and if that's the case, why were there some organizations that weren't even invited to participate? Um, so there were a number of issues, as I said, that were outlined in this document. Um, and this was sent out on, oh goodness, where is it? It was sent out in 2014. I don't have the date right now. I don't have the date on it for some reason, but that's okay. But pretty much what happened was two years later, on June 10th, 2016, the administration decided to finally address this. Two years later, after this was addressed. 
So I, I personally feel like that's a little bit problematic. But what has resulted from this entire summit is this policy called the Open and Accessible Democratic Student Organizations Policy. And what Maurice is going to do is she's going to kind of talk about the policy itself and why we feel like it is a bit, not a bit, but why we feel it is problematic. Okay? So what is this policy? Essentially, this policy was created after the Student Society Summit to impose a method of addressing complaints and disputes. This policy looks to propose an appeals committee called the University Complaint and Resolution, Resolution Council for Student Societies. This committee will be composed of five members and one non-voting member who will be there for secretarial and minute-taking support. So, the five members who have voting rights. One of them is the chair. They're initially um, appointed by the UAB or the University Affairs Board Striking Committee and they have a term of two years. The other four members are composed of four student appointees. Now, how are these student appointees picked? So, pretty much, there's going to be a pool of students where society members can send in one appointee for their so society to represent them in this panel. And they'll get picked by the chair to get onto the panel depending on the complaint. Now, ideally, because there are only four recognized societies on campus, UTSU, Graduate Students Union, APIS, and Car Scarborough Students Union, even though UTMSU should also be included in them, but they're not because of legalities. But essentially, legalities, they're just, yeah. yeah. But essentially, so there's so, four student reps from UTSU, GSU, APIS, and Scarborough Students Union. At least that's what the policy seems to say. But it doesn't really explicitly say that students from these um, respected student societies should be on that panel. It just says that students from a pool of students will be picked and will be put on the panel. Now, I want you to note and be aware of, at the University of Toronto Students' Union, UTMSU is considered a society under them. But so is 19 other societies. All these 19 societies will be expected to bring in students to this pool of students to be selected for the panel plus Scarborough, graduate students, and APIS. So in essence, we're com not competing, but we're, we're in a pool of at least 40 other organizations to be, to be that one that's picked to the committee. Yeah. Essentially, in this pool, it's going to be a majority UTSU and then the oh, other yeah. student societies. Why that's problematic for us? Already in this pool of students, there is no Mississauga representation. If UTMSU, who is seen to, rep to be represented under UTSU, can only send in one appointee, the odds of us being on a panel is very slim. And that's undemocratic. Because if complaints come forward, and we don't have a space where we can talk about our complaints or whatever is happening in our respective campuses, because each campus at UFT is different, Scarborough, downtown, and Mississauga, uh, and if we're not respecting these differences, then it's extremely hard to have a policy that is dictated on to us by other bodies to come and apply it to Mississauga when people from Mississauga or Mississauga campus haven't been um, represented or told to come and participate in this conversation about this policy and how it will affect students here. Alrighty. Um, so I guess with that being said, we've talked a little bit briefly about what the policy entails. But I guess I kind of want to address some of, the, some of the things that students have brought up because they're very valid things that students have brought up. Um, so one of the things that students have said is that like, isn't this policy really good because we want to hold our student organizations accountable? And yes, by all means, 100%, we need to hold our student organizations accountable. You know, I, that, that's, that needs to be there. That's not, we don't need to dispute that. I think we all agree with that. Um, but we already have those procedures in place to hold different groups or individuals accountable. So I want to give you folks like an example. Um, the University of Toronto Mississauga Students Union, when we have elections, we have a couple of different bodies that review um, different complaints and um, concerns. So for example, we have the Elections and Referenda Committee, which is comprised of one executive, which is the chair, as well as um, members of our board, and I believe there's one or two other um, executives on it. And all of these individuals are elected by students, for students, to do this work. So what ends up happening is if a student has a concern during an election, um, they bring it to the Elections and Referenda Committee. That committee then reviews the complaints, evidence, and they make a ruling. If the student, at the end of the day, isn't happy with the ruling that is made by the Elections and Referenda Committee, they have the Appeals Committee. That Appeals Committee is made up of APIS, UTSU, and GSU. 
Um, and the reason that that's in place is because those three organizations are actually accountable to our students because they also represent us on um, like a number of different levels in different places ac across central administration. Um, so for example, APIS represents part-time students at UTM. Uh, UTSU also represents us at the St. George campus. And then GSU, we have graduate students on our campus. So they are accountable to us. One of the issues that we have with this policy is that we would be allowing non-members to make decisions about our organization when they're not accountable to it. So if they were to make a mistake for, for some reason, what, how, what would be the measure for us to hold them accountable? At least with the UTMSU, if there is a concern um, with any of these appeals committees or anything like that, there is a procedure for you to hold us accountable. Um, so then if you're not content with the, the ruling that the appeals committee makes, then you can take it to court. Um, and we have downtown legal services to support students to make sure that they are able to um, go through those processes and make sure that they find the justice that they, that they need. Um, so the reason that this exists is because the UTMSU is in independently incorporated. We're provincially incorporated and we follow the Ontario Not-for-Profit Act. Um, so any of our, like our constitution and bylaws, which were created by students and voted for at an annual general meeting for students, are also in line with the Ontario Not-for-Profit Act. Unlike different organizations like ASU or um, some of the colleges that are not incorporated, th that's where we're kind of different. Um, I was going somewhere with that. So with Carleton, there was actually an issue at Carleton where a student was disqualified from an election. And that student brought the concern up to those relevant bodies. Um, and in each, each term, like time that they went to these committees, they found that the ruling wasn't in their favor, so they took it to court. In the end, when they took it to court, the courts ruled it in their favor, the students. So then, because of that, because we're provincially incorporated, the courts hold the student union liable. Um, but at this point in time, because we are independently incorporated, we actually don't abide by the Governing Council of the Toronto Act. And that was actually confirmed by the Omnibuds person of U of T. And that individual is pretty much the person that does research on human rights and, um, like, advocates for rights of students, faculty, members of the community, and things like that, that um, kind of interact with the University of Toronto. So that's one. We already have current processes that exist to hold us accountable. Now, I don't want to say that there's never been an issue with student unions. That's not true. I'd be lying. There have been issues with executives in the past. There have been issues with board members. There have been issues with staff. There's been issues across the board. But in the past, there haven't been issues with the UTMSU that I know up to date. But there were issues with the UTSU, with, Air, uh, with the Engineering Society, and Trinity College. And that's why the summit apparently was created. So we acknowledge that there have been issues. And I totally believe that people need to be held accountable. But I also know that these procedures already exist and are already in place. So why are we creating another committee to add to the bureaucracy, to add to the time that this takes, and to by a, by a body that's not even neutral. And that kind of brings me to my next point, is that this body by the administration is not neutral. They We can't be going to the administration as like our parent to be like, oh, look at this, this is what happened, deal with this issue. That's the court, or that's, there's even mediation. There's so many different spaces where we could have these conversations and come to solutions without having to go to the administration. The student union exists to further students' interests not to further other organizations. And the reason, one of the reasons that I feel like this plays on the student's auto student union autonomy is I'm gonna give you folks an example, okay? Fossil fuel divestment. Um, this was a campaign that many organizations across U of T have been very passionate and invested on, in, sorry, invested in. What happened to the, sorry, the, the, the computer just glitched for a second. Um, that's something that students have been really invested in. So what if a student has an issue with this campaign um, and goes to this goes to the processes and finds that things aren't being ruled in their favor and they take it to the administration and say my dad works at or my my parent or my guardian works in Alberta in the tar sands and I feel like this policy calling for fossil fuel divestment would actually be taking away my parents or my guardian's job and um, affects my family in a very negative way and I don't feel like my student dues student union dues should be going to this organization or um, this committee or whatever to be doing this campaign work, I want my money to be spent else, like elsewhere. Um, and for some reason, say the administration rules it in their favor. Then we would be withholding fees or dues on for campaigns that we all strongly believe in, but are not being addressed because of individual concerns 
with this policy. I hope that's making sense. Did that make sense? Okay. Um, and that could be carried across the board with a number of different campaigns and policies or um, advocacy work. Um, I want us to remember that the university's administration is there to further the university's agenda or their uh, priorities. That's not always necessarily the priorities of students. So for example, tuition fees. That's something that we don't all agree on. <laughs> I think that's, that's something that we all know. Cool? They're not a neutral body. So I think it's very problematic to have an organization who is, has, pol has a political agenda making decisions on behalf of our organizations. Um, that's really the, the main purpose of why these student organizations exist. Um, I have this. I, I was going somewhere with that. Um, I'm going, to, I'm going to take it to the next point because I can't remember and it, we're at 15 minutes and I'm really sorry. Um, but we feel like this is a breach of our student union autonomy because the student, the UTMSU has a legal responsibility to uphold students' um, confidentiality as well as to fulfill the processes that are outlined in our constitution and bylaws. This constitution, these constitu the, the constitution and bylaws are not there to protect us from doing what we want to do and not being held accountable by students. It's actually a method for students to hold student organizations accountable. These, the Constitution and bylaws were created by students. They were voted on at an annual general meeting. The UTSU changed their bylaws and, bylaws and parts of their constitution last year at an annual general meeting. That's a democratic process. But this committee, this appeals committee, would be able to make recommendations about our constitution, about our bylaws, about a number of different things and though they say it's non-binding, the reason that they say it's non-binding is that this appeals committee makes a recommendation to the provost or the vice provost student. And the vice provost student decides whether or not to act on those recommendations. Um, but I, I personally think that's an issue because we've seen it in the past, again, with the fossil fuel divestment where the president, Merrick Gertler, created a committee to talk about fossil fuel divestment. And that committee said, we recommend you to, to divest from fossil fuels and then the president vetoed it and said, you know what, I hear you, but I'm not going to listen to you. We're not going to divest from fossil fuels. And how upsetting is that? So imagine you have this appeals committee where students are addressing, like there's a number of different recommendations, or the, the appeals committee makes a recommendation, and the provost says, you know what, um, thank you, but I'm not going to listen to that. I'm going to, that's why it's non-binding. It's also non-binding, again, because we are a separate incorporated organization. Now, we talk about withholding funding. This policy wants to put in paper that the provost can withhold funding from our student organizations, but that's actually not legal. Um, in the past, the administration has withheld fees from ASU, which is the Arts and Science Students Union. They are not provincially or federally incorporated. Never have they withheld student union dues because they legally cannot because we are incorporated entities. Now, I want to talk about what would this, like, would this happen with the University of Toronto Faculty Association, which is the U, UTFA? No. The administration collects UTFA's union dues, but they don't have the jurisdiction to impose policies like this on them. Are we children? Are we, are we not able to follow procedures that are outlined in our constitution and bylaws? I, I don't agree with that. I think we are. That's why students are empowered to elect their representatives. That's why you are able to hold us accountable. But if this wouldn't happen with the University of Toronto Faculty Association and we know that wouldn't fly, why are we trying to impose it on students? This is supposed to be experiential learning for us, for us to learn how to deal with policies and procedures and things like this. I feel like imp implementing this policy would actually be moving backwards. Um, and that's just some part of it. Now, I know we're reaching 20 minutes, so I kind of want to tie this down. But another thing that I want to mention is that the administrative nightmare that this would be. It took the administration two years to respond to this document. Two years! So what makes us think that if we impose like a, a policy or an appeals committee like this, that we would be able to address some of the concerns in a timely manner? This policy actually doesn't talk about anything about timelines for these policies, like when these appeals committees would meet, what's the deadline for when we would have to respond to these, anything like that. Um, so I, I kind of, I, I want to tie this down, okay? Those are some of the issues that we have with this policy. I am all for holding organizations accountable. I acknowledge that there have been issues in the past with different organizations, but I do not myself personally, and I think this is a conversation that we've had with many student groups on campus, and a number of them agree, that we don't feel like this policy is the way to go about this. We can be open, accessible, and democratic in different ways, but imposing this policy would not 
bring us closer to that. In the past, the UTSU has had issues with different colleges and number of different individuals who have had issues with them. They went through the electoral process and were elected. And from my understanding, those complaints or the complaints that were had at the past, are, they don't exist anymore. Because again, we followed the electoral process, the democratic process. And I'm sure that there have been issues with some individuals and UTMSU executives or board members or anything like that. But I, I like to think that this is a new group of individuals, a new generation. I wasn't present at, in 2014 to be involved in these conversations. I wish I was because I don't want us to sit in a corner and be like, I don't like what the administration's doing. I don't, I don't believe in what they're doing or anything like that. I, also, I, I genuinely want us to be a part of solutions. And I feel like this is not the solution right now. And I feel like we need to engage in more conversations in more genuine conversations in conversations that are actually there to benefit students. I, I even, somebody brought this up to me and was like, if this policy was for students, why don't all students know about it? Why don't all mm. students know about it? Because I know when we were talking to certain individuals, this was the first time they ever heard about this policy. And if this is really in the best interest of students, I'm surprised that not more students know about it. So I'm going to leave it at that. <laughs> um, I know this is a really long vlog and it, it encompassed a lot in a really short amount of time and I talk really quickly, so I'm really sorry about that. But I really want us to have more conversations about this and be genuine about it. I have nothing to hide. I literally live in this office. Ask Maurice, we live here. Come talk to us. We want to have conversations about this. We want to have solutions to this. But I don't think it's fair by pointing at people and being like, you don't want to be held accountable or you're corrupt or anything like that. I'm, I genuinely want to help students. I genuinely believe that student organizations are here for students, by students. And I really hope that we can continue to keep it that way because there's no one looking out for our better interests than us as students. So I'm going to leave it at that. Do you have anything to add? No, you covered it. <laughs> Alrighty. Well, we're just going to end it off by saying that tomorrow is the Governing Council meeting. Um, we're going to be going, so if you folks want to head out, uh, we're going to probably be taking a shuttle around 3 o'clock. Um, that way we could be present for this meeting. Um, so I invite you folks to join in. If you folks are in opposition of this policy, we really encourage you folks to um, email your opposition to provost at utoronto.ca or um, NCC, sorry, GC at utmsu.ca or autonomy at utmsu.ca. I'm going to type that down at the bottom of the vlog so you folks have that. Um, and also tweet students for students at the University of Toronto um, and the University of Toronto Mississauga. Um, so yeah, I really hope that you folks will be engaged in this and have conversations and ask questions. Um, and if there's anything that's been unclear about this, please email us at info at utmsu.ca or president at utmsu.ca and I'll send it to everybody. Um, that way we could have more conversations about this. I'm really sorry that this took so long, but I'm also <laughs> really happy that it took this long because we need to have these conversations. I said conversations a lot. Okay, bye y'all. Bye.